option. However, God is leading and God is blessing. And it is a blessing that we are together once more today as we progress from where we left yesterday. As uh, the elder has rightly said, uh, we are recording everything. And then if you miss it on uh, the Fountain Forum, you can always uh, get it on our forum as well. And uh, not only that, but there's quite a lot of other messages which can actually enhance your understanding of the present truth. So I'm going to invite you where possible. Let's kneel and then once more and then we pray together as we zero into the message for tonight. Shall we pray? This evening, dear Lord, it's a special evening. We sincerely invite your presence as we've been praying throughout now, Lord Jesus, it's your time. Minister to your children in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have a wonderful presentation today. I want to welcome you, those who are on Zoom, and I want to welcome you, those who are on YouTube, and also our colleagues on uh, Facebook. Uh, we are looking at the subject of sealing process and the 144,000. As you know, this is actually such a wonderful topic. And many of us, uh, there's been a lot of debates and argument about the 144,000. Is it literal? Is it symbolic? To be honest with you, I'm going to focus on those things which I felt, which I've been impressed by the spirit, that these things are very important. And if we're going to talk much about these debates of whether it's symbolic or, or whether literal, we'll deal with that. But however, I'm sure by the spirit of God, we'll focus on those things which are critical. So I want you to follow this very closely as we focus on this i hope you can hear me whenever you cannot hear me please just say we can't hear you and then we see we can adjust something the bible says in the book of revelation chapter 7 from verse 1 and after these things i saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth. you know the four corners of the earth we are talking of the four sides of the combat east southwest so the angels are holding the four winds now the question is what exactly are the four winds the bible says in the book of jeremiah chapter 25 from verse 31 a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth the lord has a controversy with the nations he will plead with all flesh he will give them that are wicked to the sword says the lord that says the Lord of hosts, Behold, if we shall go forth from nation to nation, and the great will we shall be raised up, strife. If you look at Daniel chapter 7, you find that, you know, there was strife on the sea, and then a beast will rise up, a strife on the sea, a beast will rise up. So when we are talking about winds, we are talking about turbulence, we are talking about war, we are talking about calamities and problems. And God says uh, there are four angels which are holding the winds. And the reason why these four angels are holding the winds The reason why there is a delay, the delay is simply because God is sealing his people. And this process is taking long. In fact, the process is not taking long. But God wants to ensure that he saves everyone that needs to be saved. You can get the same from Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 1. The Bible says, that says the Lord, behold, I realize that, you know, these nucleus which are being piled, one day will be used. These war, these, 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 these machines of war, what they will be used. But today you find that, you know, God is holding through his angels. He's holding the four winds until such a time. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 7 verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hate the earth and the sea, saying, Hate not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. So now the reason why there is a delay to allow these winds to plunge, to destroy, it is because sealing process is taking place. Have sealed our servants. Now the question is, what exactly is a seal? Let me take to the book of Romans chapter 4, verse 11. The Bible says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness, of the faith which he 
he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe through, though they be not circumcised, that the right that righteousness might be imputed unto them all. So a seal and a mark and a sign is one and the same thing. It's a sign of circumcision. It's a seal of righteousness. So we are talking about a sign. We are talking about a seal. It's one and the same thing. Now let me take you to the book of Esther chapter 8 verse 8. I know you are very familiar to these verses. Write ye also to the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. So now the one who has power to seal is the king. He will seal with his ring. He will seal in his name. And nobody can change what he has written. Now, let's actually take it again from the book of Isaiah chapter 33 verse 22. Let's look at the one who has authority to seal now. For the Lord is our judge. That's Isaiah chapter 33 verse 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. So the judge, the lawgiver, he is also the one that will save us. Not only that, he is the power to seal. To, he, he has the power to seal. Why? Because he is a lawgiver. I chapter 8, verse 16, the Bible says, bind up the testimony and seal the law among. Now the question is, what exactly does that mean? Great Controversy, page five, uh, 452, paragraph 1 says, the Lord commands by the same prophet, bind up the testimony Seal the law among my disciples. That's Isaiah chapter 8, 16. The seal of God's law is found in the fourth commandment. Now the question is, why is the seal found in the fourth commandment? It goes on to say, this only of all the ten brings to view both the name and the title of the law. And he is also, where did he create? He created the earth. And then he goes on to say, it declares him to be the creator of the earth, heavens and the earth. And thus shows his claim to reverence and worship above all others. Aside from this precept, there is nothing in the Decalogue to show by whose authority the law is given. So we worship God as we learned from a day before yesterday and yesterday to create God because of his ability to sustain. His worship because he created heaven, the earth, and the sea, and the fountains of water. This is a call of worship to worship, which is uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. Now, the question is, what is the seal of God? Last day, page 214, paragraph 4, it says, Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads. So now, the sealing takes place in their foreheads. Now the question is, are we going to have a mark on our foreheads? I wish I had a long time. I was going to explain in detail what it means to have the seal of God. But however, let the spirit of prophecy explain to us. It is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come indeed has begun already. That's why tomorrow we are going to talk about shaking. We are talking about sealing today, but tomorrow we are going to talk about shaking. So now sealing, the Bible says this is settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually. What actually that means is that mentally, I understand what I believe. I can tell what I believe. Practically, I live according to what I profess. In other words, my religion is not that of mouth, but it's reflected in my life. Morally, I conduct my life according to the principles of that which I believe. Therefore, I'm grounded and I'm rooted in the spirit principles of God. When we have come to a point when the character of Christ is reflected in our life, then we have been sealed. We have settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually. Now listen to what Ezekiel says. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto him, 
go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Now Ezekiel is watching, and in this vision, God is saying to the men, go through the city, set a mark on the foreheads of on those who cry and sigh about the abomination that are done in Israel. If I had time, I will talk about the abomination, but for to this presentation, I will leave that. But however, if you want to know more about it, I've done another presentation called The Ceiling. You can find it on our channel, which talks very much. We focus on the abominations. But for this one, we are dealing with a different thing altogether, but we leave that aside. Now the question is, let's actually look at what it means to cry and sigh about the abomination. What does it mean when you cry and sigh? Now the question is, how do you view the abomination or how do you view sin? The book Testimonies, volume 3, page 266, paragraph 2 says, the true people of God who have the spirit of the uh, work of the Lord and the salvation of souls at heart, whoever views sin in its real sinful character. So they will view sin in its real character. They will always be on the side of faithful and plain dealing with sins, which easily beset the people of God. Now righteousness has been compromised. People have sugar-caught sin. Sin is no longer called sin anymore, but the children of God, they will call sin by its rightful name. They will not mince their words. They will be honest they will be faithful and they will be truthful. Therefore, they will cry and sigh when they see the abominations. Uh, I, I, I'm here in England. And when we arrived uh, uh, from Zimbabwe a long time ago, we arrived in England and there was this term called cohabitation. When we arrived in England and people started talking about cohabitation, I was trying to understand what exactly that it means. And no, cohabitation is, you know, as a, a, the boyfriend and girlfriend, they live together. But I said, listen, that's adultery. That's fornication. The real term for such things is fornication and adultery. But this world, they will say it's cohabitation. When you are cohabitating, you are in sin. That's what many people do when they go abroad or when they are in diaspora. They will do those things which they don't do when many of their relatives are watching. But the children of God will sigh and cry. When I was new in England, People used to talk about these people who steal money with credit cards and they would do a lot of uh, credit card and they would be cheating and stealing money. And they would not say this is stealing, but say this is you are helping yourself. This is the way we need to make money and go home quickly. But listen, that's cheating and stealing. Not only that, it's very common in diaspora. That, you know, when people get into diaspora, they don't, sometimes they don't have papers. So they have to use a certain name. You try and find out to somebody, what is your name? They will tell you, my name is John Smith. Are you sure you are John Smith? Yes, I'm John Smith. But when you, when, you, when, you, when you try and find out, you realize that his name is actually John Smith. His name is Togarepi Maposa, but he's using John Smith so that he can fit in the environment. He is lying, and then they say, God help those who help themselves. My brothers and sisters, the children of God will cry and sigh about the abomination that are happening in the land. It doesn't matter what you are doing. It doesn't doesn't matter whether you think you are saving life or not. The moment you are living contrary to God, it's sin. And then it says, especially in the, in the closing work of the church, in the sealing time of the 144,000 who are to stand without fault before the throne of God, will they feel most deeply the wrongs of the God's professed people? You know, if there is something which is so painful, let me talk about preacher. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I know there are some preachers when they stand before people, they start giving testimonies that never existed. When they stand before people, they start misrepresenting information. They they use the tools of the devil to try and bring people to know God. It does not work that way, my brothers and sisters. Later, why ye be ye? 
Let our nay be nay. Let us be honest and truthful, and the people that should be sealed will be faithful people. Now it says here, testimonies to ministers, page 446, paragraph 2. Will this seal be put upon the impure in mind, the fornicator, the adulterer, the man who... What do you do in darkness when nobody is watching you? Does my character correspond to the qualifications essential that I may receive a passport to the mansions Christ has prepared? For those who are fitted for them, holiness must be in rot in, their, in our character. In other words, if we are to be saved, my brother says, there should be purity. There should not be anything that is associated with the devil. This is a message about of overcoming sin and living a righteous life. And if we are to be saved, if we are to be to, to be sealed, then we need to come a time when we call a spade a spade. Let people hate you for that which is good, rather than people to love you because you cannot call sin by its name. You'd rather please people than pleasing God. We are going to deal with that when we are dealing with the subject of shaking tomorrow. Now it says in the, it, it goes on to say, those who are overcome, those that overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil will be the favored ones who shall receive the seal of the living God. Those whose hands are not clean, whose hearts are not pure, will not have the seal of the living God. My brothers and my sister, are your hands clean? Is your heart pure? Do you have anything to be blamed of? This is the message of victory over sin. Position of those who are repenting and confessing their sins in the great and typical day of atonement will be recognized and marked as worthy of God's protection. Since 1844, we are living in the day of atonement. We are living in the untypical day of atonement when we need to make sure that we do not have any sins that return in our lives. We need to confess our sins before God. We need to be faithful and truthful. We need to live a life. When God looks at me today, do I have anything that I may be blamed of? My brothers and sisters, is there cleanliness in my heart? Am I honest with myself? Am I honest with my neighbor? Am I truthful in my words? Am I truthful in my heart? This is the expectation of God. If we are to be victorious, Christianity is practical. It's how we live. It's how we conduct ourselves. We have spoken about the beast. We have spoken about the image of the beast. And we have made it very clear that power of the beast is the power of the devil. The power of the image of the beast is the power of the devil. And we made it very clear that in these final days, the contest is between the commandments of God and the commandments of men, and especially the commandment, the fourth commandment of the Sabbath. That the question is, as an Adventist who keep the seventh day Sabbath, will that help make me to receive the seal of God? Let me read Read Maranatha, page 240, paragraph 4. He says, not all professors, not all who profess to keep the Sabbath will be sealed. My brothers and sisters, there are many people who are in church who are just wasting their time and they are going nowhere. There are many people in church who have backslidden long time ago tomorrow. So please follow it very clearly tomorrow because we are going to focus on that very well. It says... Uh, there are many even among those who teach the truth to others who will not receive the seal of God in their foreheads. They had the light of truth. They knew their master's will. They understand every point of our faith, but they had not corresponding works. What exactly does that mean? They know about healthy living. But they are not following that. They don't follow that. They know about uh, eight laws of health. They don't follow that. They know about how to conduct themselves. They know the spirit of prophecy in and out, but they don't follow that. You find them eating ice cream like the world. You find them enjoying coffee like the world. You find them enjoying flesh food like the world. They justify everything they do, even with the Bible. My brothers and sisters, 
sisters, in the process of sanctification, we need to be in correspondence to the light that we have, re- what has been revealed to us. If God has revealed truth to us, we ought to walk in that truth. If God has given us health laws, we need to live by the health laws. If God has given us principles of diet, we need to live by the principles of diet. You realize that, you know, as truth is revealed to us, it is only when we live in correspondence to the light that has been given that God will continue to shine the light to us. But if we are not living according to that, then we will not be sanctified. Maranatha, page 240, paragraph 7, says, Now is the time to prepare. The seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of the ambitious, world-loving men or women. It will never be members of good and regular standing. They have nothing to be blamed of in church. But however, before God, the question is, are we not blamed? Before God is our character pure. When you read the book of Matthew chapter 6, especially if you start from verse 22 going downwards, you realize that Jesus was talking and said, listen, no man can save two masters at a time. He said that you love one and you hate another. You cannot save God, and you cannot save Mormon. There is no way, my brothers and sisters, we want to win in the world, and we also want to win in the church. The two don't work together. We cannot win both. One, we, we, we have to lose one. The question is, what are we going to lose? Are we going to lose the world and gain Jesus? Or are we going to gain Jesus and lose the world? We cannot save two masters. We just need to make a choice. If we are to come to God faithfully. Remember, we need to take our cross and follow him. And in taking our cross, this is a life of sacrifice. It is a life of giving up so many things. If it is a life of being faithful and truthful, these are the people that will be sealed. They will have the name of God written in their foreheads. The seal of God is to have the name of God written in their foreheads. We think with our mind, we have the name of God in our minds. We have the character of God in our lives and the character of God will be reflected. My brothers and sisters, this gospel, towards the end of the time, those who preach the third angel, those who preach the fourth angels, they will not preach so much with their mouth. All the arguments are being done. We are presenting the arguments at the moment. But at the end of the time, my brothers and sisters, it will be the character. The reason why Jesus is delaying his coming, it is because Colossians chapter 127 has not been fulfilled yet in our lives. Our lives is not reflecting the character of God. But when the mystery of godliness has been revealed among the Gentiles, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Then Revelation chapter 18 verse 1 will be fulfilled. The angel of the Lord will come down with great glory and the earth will be enlightened with his glory and the call will be very loud to call people to come out of Babylon. Why? Those who shall call people out of Babylon are those who have received the seal of God, number one, are those who have received the letter rain number two, these are the 144,000. When you look at the 144,000, especially in the book of Revelation chapter 14, as we are going on it now, it is a given in context of the preaching, the three angels message. After talking about the 144,000, then their mission is giving, given from verse 6. But now let's go to chapter 14 from verse 1 of Revelation. The Bible says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of the great thunder, and I heard the voice of harps harping with harps. Now the hundred and forty-four thousand, 
had been redeemed, the 144,000, they are already in heaven standing on Mount Zion with Jesus Christ. And now they have been given harps that they can sing the song of their experience. In other words, they have a story to tell. They have gone through great tribulation. They have gone through challenging time. They have been tested and tried as we are going to learn shortly. Verse 3, the Bible says, and they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So now the 144,000, they have a special tune. They can learn that song. Moses cannot sing it. Elijah cannot sing it. Enoch cannot sing it. Why? Because they are not part of the 144,000. But it's only those who have gone through great tribulation. They have gone through the time of the seven last plagues while they are on earth. They have preached the gospel during the time when the national Sunday law had been declared and they, they, did not, they did not love their lives even unto death. And now they are singing the song of their experience. Now the question is this, my brothers and sisters, if we are going to be part of the 144,000, what experience are we going to share? If we are going to be part of the 144,000, what will be our song? Now it says in verse 4, these are they which were not defiled with women. In other words, remember, women in Bible prophecy is a church, and there are only two churches. There are only two, uh, Revelation chapter 12, which is a pure woman, and Revelation chapter 17, which is a doubterous church. Now, this church of Revelation chapter 12, she is the one that will be saved. She is the remnant church, so she has not been defiled, for they are virgins. They are, th these are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever we go with. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. They are the first fruits. They are redeemed from among men. They have come out of the dread tribulation and they have not participated in any teachings of the devil. They have been undefiled. Now the question is, who exactly are they? Because they are saying they are the 144,000. Let's go back to the book of Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. The Bible says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now the question is, are these Israelites by birth? You know, this is the most interesting thing that you find in, in, in the Bible. When you go to the book of Revelation chapter 7, you realize that you know everything is different. Jacob, the first one was Reuben. But when you go to the book of Revelation chapter 7, you realize that the firstborn is Judah. Judah is the one who was given the covenant. So he is the one who is one of the child is missing. Dan is missing. But in the place of Dan is Manasseh. Now the question is what has happened to these two? You realize that you know this, if we are looking at the children of Israel, this is actually not the literal children of Jacob. Let me come home a bit. The children of Jacob were 12 tribes. Ten of them went to the northern kingdom, which was known as Samaria. And the two of them remain in Judah, which is Judah and Benjamin. Judah and Benjamin remain in Judah. But the ten tribes of the north, they were taken captive by the Assyrians. And then there was mixed marriages. In these mixed marriages, they come up with this nation called Samaritans. Now the Samaritan is a product of mixed marriages. is not a pure Jew. That's why those of Benjamin and Judah, when they look at the Samaritan, they will say the sons of Halot. They will say they are outcasts. Why are they outcasts? Because they are the children of adultery. Now they went into captivity and they disappeared completely. So those 10 tribes are no more today. Now the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, these are the two tribes that remain in Jerusalem. They were taken into captivity in Babylon and they returned to Jerusalem. So right now, the only tribes of Judah left is Benjamin, it's, 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 uh, it's Judah and Benjamin. And the rest of them are not are no more. So the question is, are we dealing with a symbolic 
or literal. Now, we are dealing with something which is symbolic because in the New Testament, we don't have Israel as a nation. We have Israel now as Christian. Now, let's look at the, uh, the 144, uh, the figurative or literal part of it. Now, if you remember the Israelites, Jesus, in fact, the book of Daniel chapter 9, gave the Israelites 490 years. And after 490 years, the gospel went to the Gentiles. If you remember, as Jesus was now closing his mission, Matthew chapter 23 from verse 37, the Bible says, after they had rejected him, Jesus looked at Jerusalem and then he started crying on verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hand gathereth and her, her cheeks under her wings, but you will not. In other words, they rejected the salvation of Jesus, and Jesus was crying for Jerusalem. He wanted to save them like a hand gathereth his children to verse 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. That was was the last time when Jesus stepped his foot in Jerusalem temple. That was the last time. This was the end of Jen as a nation. This was the end of Jewish as a nation. In other words, this was the departure of the covenant to the Jews as a nation. And remember, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus had already said, on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So from that very day, Israel was rejected as a nation. But however, the door was still open to individuals. And in AD 34, when they stoned Stephen, they sealed their fate, and they, they and the cry was heard, Ichabod, the glory has departed. And in AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed without mercy. Why? Because the protection of God had been removed. So now the question is, where are the Israelites, which Revelation is talking about in chapter 7? The Bible says in the book of Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, looking at the Israelites, and if you be Christians, then you are Abraham's seed, and here as according to the promise. So the true children of God are the Israelites. The Abraham's seed are here as according to the promise. You know, when you learn from Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, you realize that, you know, Israel was the kingdom of priests. As Israel was the kingdom of priests, who then now is the kingdom of priests? First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I know you know these verses very well. The Bible says, but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You realize that the call which is ex was extended to Israel. So the Christian of today took over from Israel. Not all Christians, but the remnant church of today took over from Israel. That's why it is called the remnant church of the Bible prophecy. That's why it is called the Israel of today. Why? Because she kept the commandments of God, the commandments which was given to Israel. The same covenant which was given to Israel is the same covenant which is there today. In other words, we are saved to we are saved through the lineage of Abraham, and Abraham is the father of faith. And the true Israelites they will follow in the footsteps of Abraham to obey the law of God. Let me go further. Romans chapter 2, verse 28. Looking at the nation of Israel, for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inward, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. So when you are talking of Jews, I am a Jew, for I follow God, I am a Jew. And everyone who go to heaven, he is a Jew. Now when you read Bible commentary, page 5, not inherited by natural descent. That's why when you go to chapter 7 of Revelation where we are, we don't see the children of Jesus.
the order they were born but we see the children of jacob according to the covenant the covenant was given to judah even though reuben was the firstborn but he did not qualify therefore the covenant was handed to judah and even today you find that you know those who become the real children of israel are those who obey so when we are looking for the 144000 we will find the 144000 among those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. 144,000 will not come and at the loud cry. 144,000 is the one that will preach. The 144,000 are those who preach the loud cry message. This is a special army which is trained to preach the gospel. They will call sin by its rightful name and they will preach the gospel even in difficult times. The Bible says in James chapter 1 verse 1, this is the brother of Jesus, but tracing who are the Israelites. He said, James a servant of God and of, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greeting. James is writing to Christians. As he's writing to Christians, he is regarding them as the children. And he is regarding, the, 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 regarding them as the 12 tribes of Israel. Therefore, Christians are the Jews. Obedient children of God are the Jews. But now the question is, there is something special in this group that I want us to understand as we go towards the end. It says in the book of Revelation chapter 5, 14, verse 4, if you are going to forget everything, please don't forget this one. Now understand this. And in their mouth was found no guile. In the mouth of the 144,000 was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now the question is, what exactly is guile? Let me go step by step. And thy lips from speaking guile. In other words, when we are talking of guile, we are talking of sin, we are talking of lies, we are talking of that is which is evil. Verse chapter 32, verse 2, the Bible says, Blessed is the man whom unto whom the Lord imputed no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. So Psalm chapter 32 says, In his spirit there is no guile. In other words, he does not think evil, he does not meditate evil. He has no time to be entertained with evil. He has no time to entertain evil. And this person is so blessed. Now the question is, can I leave? John chapter 1 verse 47, Jesus looking at Nathaniel says, and Jesus, and Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said unto him, Behold an Israelite in, indeed in him in whom there is no guile. So Nathaniel lived without a guile. As Jesus looked at Nathaniel, he could not see anything to blame Nathaniel of. And he said, Behold an Israelite indeed. Can I live without sin in this world? Now look at the example of Jesus Christ. John chapter 14 verse 13. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. There was no trace of anything in Jesus which was associated with the devil. But let me take it from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Now the question is, what was the example of Jesus Christ? Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. My brothers and sisters, we can live a life without sin. The question is, how did Jesus make a choice? And even us today, we can make a choice to commit sin. We can make a choice to flee from sin. Listen to Maranatha, page 225. Uh, it says, is no excuse for sin. However great the pressure brought to bear upon the soul, transgression is our own act. It is not in the power of earth or hell to compel anyone to sin. The will must concern, the heart must yield, or passion cannot overbear reason, no force you to act sin. Sin is your own act. The devil may tempt you. The devil may do all kinds of things. And that you know, it is you that will make a decision to, to, to sin. Therefore, this is the choice that you make for yourself. You find that you know, it is, it is not in the power of earth, heaven 
or in the power of earth or, or hell to compel anyone to sin. The moment the devil try to force you into sin, God will stop him. God will stop him. The devil can only entice you and then you make a decision to walk into sin by yourself. Imagine people will say, I was forced into adultery. I didn't want to do it, but I was forced. She forced me. How, how, how did she force you? You walked into the house of a prostitute. You removed your trousers by yourself. And you did the act by yourself. And then you said, I was forced. No, you were not. You consented. You made a choice by yourself. I, I, I was forced. You know, they put, uh, they put food in front of me. I could not resist. You washed your hands by yourself. And you made a choice to pick the food and to put it on your mouth. It was within your choice to say no. In other words, you find that, you know, as children of God, we need to come to a point we can be, where we can be disciplined to say no. To say no to sin. To say no to gossip. To say no to adultery. To say no to fornication. To say no to lies. Those who will be saved are those who have been victorious over every step. Revelation chapter 15 verse 2, the Bible says, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. These, these are the 144, together with another large crowd of people. You realize that the 144 and the mark character, now they are standing before God. They have been victorious. No. When you look at the 144, they've gone through the time of tribulation. They have resisted the devil and all his temptation. They have been leading in the preaching of the third angel message. And the Bible says they are the first fruits, meaning that, you know what, they are another group which is much bigger. This is just a small selection, but there is another group which is much bigger. And also something very interesting, they are translated to heaven alive. A book, Patrick's and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, page 591, looking at this group of people, it says, now they are dressed in white while they are in heaven, the spotless robe of Christ. Now look at those who receive this spotless robe of Christ. The spotless robe of Christ's righteousness is placed upon the tried, tempted, faithful children of God. They despise the remnant are clothed in glorious, uh, glorious apparel, never more to be defiled by the corruptions of the world. Their names are retained in the Lamb's Book of Life, enrolled among the faithful of all ages. They have resisted the wills of the deceiver. They have not been turned from their loyalty by the dragon's role, even though the National Sunday had been, law had been declared. Even though persecution, will you be able to stand in that situation? For you to be able to stand in that situation, you think at this juncture. Now, there are some people who said, I don't mind myself. I, 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 all I want is to go to heaven. I, I, I may not qualify. In fact, the debate is that, is the 144,000 literal number or not? Now, this is the most interesting thing. I've read in the last day events, and I actually am convinced that it's a literal number. But however, the question is, are they the ones that you'll be saved only? No, the Bible does not say that, neither <laughs> the last day events. But now let me say to you, there is something that is important that is found among, between the two groups that shall be saved. The number that cannot be counted in the 144. And that's what Review and Herald, March 9, Page 105 says, which is the last quotation I'll read tonight. It says, I want you to follow this clearly before we pray. It says, let us strive with all the power that God has given us to be among the 144,000. And let us do all that we can to help others to gain heaven. It's only those who have the character of 144,000 who enter the pearly gates. It's only those of the 144,000 who will be sealed. 
It's only those who have a character of 144,000 who will preach the everlasting gospel, especially during the troublous time. But now the question is, how will they manage to do that? It is because they have been faithful, they have been truthful, and their robes have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And they are now without spot nor wrinkle candidates before God. My brothers and sisters, this is a call of God to us. We are called to be in this group. My brothers and sisters, in this week of prayer, the desire of God is that we may be victorious over sin. We may be victorious over pride. We may be victorious over every besetment. And that power is available today. And if we are to be saved, there is only one character that will enter heaven, is the character of 144. Whether I will die before Jesus comes and I will not be in the 144, or I will live until the coming of Jesus Christ that I should be part of 144, the one avenue, there is only one avenue for all of us. We need to be victorious over every sin. And if it is your desire that God may help you to be victorious over every sin, I will ask you, to bow wherever possible, wherever possible, to kneel, kneel with me that we may pray together. If you cannot kneel, just bow where you are that we may pray together. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, for the time that you have given us. The singer says, when the saints go marching in, Lord, I want to be in that number. To be in the number 144 to be in the number that is uncountable. But it's only those who have been victorious over, every, over the beast, over his mark, over his image, over his number. And Lord Jesus, we cannot be victorious if we are not in you. We pray sincerely that your spirit may be upon us so that we may be victorious. Lord, please, in the name of Jesus, teach us to believe your word. And allow us by thy grace, O Lord, that we may be sanctified. Let our eating habits change. Let our lifestyle change. Let our dressing change. Let our conduct change. Lord Jesus, not that we, saw, we don't want to change that we may be saved, but we want to have you first. So when we have you in our hearts, all that is nothing to do with you will fall down. Thank you for this opportunity. Extend your blessing to each and every one of us tonight. And as we prepare for tomorrow, Lord, may your spirit be upon us. May your power be upon us. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name in Jesus' name. Amen. My brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you. And we meet tomorrow as we focus on the subject of shaking. God bless you.